welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show but this isn't any episode this is fundraisers friday with one of the great and most brilliant minds in the nonprofit sector mr tony bell welcome back my dear friend thank you so much julia it's great to be here and happy friday happy friday you know we're going to launch a new thing called fundraisers friday because we think that this concept, this epic task that fundraisers have deserves its own day. What do Absolutely. you think? Absolutely. Any day we can celebrate the work of fundraisers is a great day. And why not make it Friday? I love it. I think it's such a great way. I think we can be reflective of what's gone on for the week. We can maybe reset for the next start of the week. So many fundraisers have weekend things that they have to attend to and go to and put on and manage. And so we just feel like this is going to be a really exciting thing. You're going to hear more and more about it. And if you want to get involved, just go ahead and let us know here at the nonprofit show. We wanted to kick this off. And Tony, this came about from a conversation, a private conversation that you and I had about somebody accusing you of using the word selling and they kind of treated it like it was a dirty word in our sector. And so I borrowed that experience. I thought that might have been the catalyst for this particular topic. So I made sure to bring my hand sanitizer for today's for today's dirty conversation. So uh, I hope all of our, our audience did the same. Oh my God, that's just priceless. Yeah, well, I didn't want to like throw you under the bus, but I was so intrigued when you had a conversation, you just used this word, phrase, you know, selling in a very soft way, and it just created a lot of heartburn. So I want to get into it. You know, we are here because we have amazing sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. Tony Bell is our co-host today, and you've probably seen him on some other episodes along with our amazing cohort because they are just thrilling to watch and to hear. They come from all parts of the country, and they join me, Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, um, in this amazing uh, journey that we've taken. Okay, let's start off. When I first met you five years ago, you introduced, I know, you're like, what? Yeah, I was a blonde then. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tony, you're the one that really introduced me to the, the phrase cause selling. And for me, that kind of, I got to admit, flipped, you know, a lot of switches. Talk to me about what cause selling is so that we can start off in that direction. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm happy to, Julia. And yeah, really, where does the time go, right? I mean, but I guess when you're having fun, it just flies, right? So <laughs> I'll just attribute it to constantly having fun. But, uh, but you know, I had the pleasure of, of, of meeting you and, and connecting with you in the nonprofit show around mm -hmm. the cost selling curriculum that exists at the Fundraising Academy at National University. So mm -hmm. I was just, you know, fortunate to be one of many kind of ambassadors and spokespeople uh, for a really great curriculum. But it is a little bit uh, controversial only in its naming. So cause selling really supports uh, the idea and notion that in fact we are all selling and we are all selling all the time. Uh, but in this particular example of cause selling, what we're doing is selling a solution. What we're doing is, is selling an idea. Uh, what we're doing is selling uh, community needs to folks that have a shared passion for the mission of the causes that we support in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, so that's really where cause selling comes from. It is all about relationships, and it is a great process to help you starting from cultivation to stewardship uh, mm -hmm. of your donor or investor for your organization. So uh, so yeah, so really, we use the term selling really to support the process that's involved in successful fundraising. Yeah, and I, 
You, well, first of all, I witnessed to you, I witnessed to the team at uh, National University. If I had been educated on this process when I was a young community leader, you know, fundraiser, which I've never been a paid fundraiser. I've just been a community fundraiser. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have raised millions, millions more for my community because I was always one one of the people asked to go to the big at to the big asks, right? Because yeah. I didn't have any fear. You know, I was like, I, you know, if I believed in it, I could tell somebody why I thought they needed to invest. Didn't always work out, right? Did not always work out because I didn't really understand why it wouldn't work out. And so with cause selling, I learned you know, it's a mystery. I learned how to be more intelligent and also more relationship focused. It's not just about showing up to the meeting and, and having, frankly, the balls to ask for $10 million. No, right. Exactly. And, and I've always felt it. And you're right, Julie, you've been very transparent around how you felt like cause selling would have improved your your success rate, if you will, historically. And the same with me. I feel the same way, too, early on. Had I followed this very specific and easy process, yes. uh, I would have been much more successful. We did a lot of these steps. It's an eight-step process. I mean, we did a lot of these steps without having a name for them uh, mm -hmm. because we intuitively knew that they were the right thing to do when we talk about building relationships. But to mm -hmm. see it spelled out and put into, into steps that are easy to follow, uh, can't do anything but help support greater success uh, right. when we get to the point where we're about to make an ask. Yeah, that's a wonderful way to phrase it because I think that we worry about manipulation. You know, we worry about the, you know, the, the concept of if I can make a donor cry, if I can get them tipsy, if I can make them cry, I'm going to get the check, right? And it's such a manipulative I think backward way of thinking. And so um, for me, it's just a more logical, strength-based way to say, look, we're trying to solve a community problem. You can be part of that solution. Mm -hmm. And that is selling, right? We're selling an idea. We're trying to sell a concept um, and we're selling engagement. And so for me, that's not a bad word, but I guess too, it depends where you're coming from because I've been in sales pretty much all my life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like a dirty word, right? Mm -hmm. I right. mean, I think depending on where you're coming from. But when we think about this negative association, how do you go back to a board or how do you go to a team and say selling is okay? Or do you come up with a different word? I mean, how do we get into the heads of the people that we're trying to navigate this through? Yeah, well, I think part of, and and when you and I had the conversation that brought us to today's topic, mm -hmm. uh, when I used the term selling, and I really used it in terms of the curricula when I talked about cost selling, uh, just the word selling immediately folks think of a transaction. And we are certainly not in a transactional place as fundraisers. Uh, we are in a relationship business. So I think for a lot of folks, the word selling just immediately connects with a transaction and no one wants to feel like they're working in transaction mode uh, in, in the nonprofit space. Certainly as a professional fundraiser, I don't want to feel like I'm um, just working with, trans, you know, it's a transaction. And certainly in the eyes of a donor, a donor or investor for your organization does not want to feel like a transaction. So I think that that's part of, of the pushback from the word selling. Uh, the, ir the irony around all of that, and again, this kind of goes back to the conversation you and I had during kind of my interview experience, was after I mentioned selling, it was like, oh, well, we don't think of it as selling. Then the conversation went on to where it was explained to me how uh, the success of fundraisers are based on the organization's OKRs and KPIs. Right. right. So so, you know, the, the key results and the key performance indicators. Well, KPIs, I mean, all of that is tied into business kind of models and yeah. sales and sales strategies. So a lot of the terminology in terms of 
how fundraisers' uh, success are being measured uh, by the board or by senior leadership uh, falls very much under the umbrella of sales. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so I really think that that's really why there's such a negative association with the word really, mm -hmm. really is that connectivity or that thought that it's all about a transaction where really when we're talking about selling and when we use the word selling in, in nonprofit, we're really talking about the process that we might use in which to develop relationships, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with potential donors or investors to our organization. Well, I think you bring up a great comment in, in that structurally in uh, business for profit or nonprofit, we have tools and metrics, we have software, we have uh, concepts and leadership concepts of how we're going to measure, how we're going to set goals, how we're going to set our objections, objectives, how we're going to monitor, you know, when we're going to monitor and all that. And so sales, it's part of that. That's part of the nomenclature that we use in order to do this. But, you know, if you think about a director of sales and marketing and for-profit, it's the same thing as the director of development in nonprofit, right? Well, it was funny because, because you, you said objections there initially. And I was thinking, you know, and I was thinking, well, one of, you know, one of the steps within the call selling cycle is, you know, handling objections. Objection. And that is certainly a key part of any sales training that you would have mm -hmm. in a for-profit kind of, you know, mm -hmm. situation. Uh, and handling objections uh, it, within the cost selling curriculum really is all about embracing them and, and looking at them as a positive. Mm -hmm. And that objections are really a way to just keep the conversation moving forward uh, as, a par as opposed to a hard stop, like no. Um, right. Right. Yeah, so... So there's so much about the success within sales that, you know, appropriately fits within the success of fundraising in the nonprofit sector. Right. It's such an interesting, interesting thing. Now, I want to move on to, and, and here's that word again, sales training. And if you feel more comfortable, development training or fundraising training. But this is my question to you. Do you think that if you're somebody who's let's say let's say have had have had amazing sales training like the pharmaceutical industry is known for their superior sales training maybe you've come from from the pharmaceutical world can you take some of those training things in the for profit and and navigate them into the nonprofit will you oh. see similarities all of them and in, in my experience all of them i mean i I stepped into the nonprofit space after 12 years with American Express in a for-profit, you know, setting. Mm -hmm. All of those sales skills, all of those leadership skills transfer over. I mean, I'm not the first to say it. You hear it all the time. 501c3 is a tax status, not a mm -hmm. business model, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you hear it all the time again. I'm not, I'm not the creator of it. I'm just sharing, you know, again, what a lot of folks have heard many, many times. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, so I think how can the sector embrace sales training? I think first the sector can do a better job at embracing professional development. So whatever mm -hmm. that might look like, and whether that's sales training, volunteer, man, whatever that is, uh, I think the sector can do a, a better job at investing in professional development. Uh, mm -hmm. And funders uh, can do a better job at supporting those types of initiatives for nonprofits. Uh, because we've certainly seen, uh, and again, if I use my own experience through the Fundraising Academy at National University, we had folks that would come out of that program uh, going through the cost selling curriculum, raising a lot more money for their organization because now they felt more empowered and they mm -hmm. felt like they had better tools to mm -hmm. meet the needs of their community and the organizations that they're serving. Right. You know, I, what you say is, it, to me, it harkens back this um, statement, you know, hope is not a strategy, okay. right? I'm not going to go to this ask and hope I get it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you're the one of the first ones that said to me, Julia, if you're following a model, if you're following a sequence, by the time you navigate to the ask, 
you have done all this work and you pretty much know how this is going to go. So you can, it's not as stressful because you have a relationship, you have history, you have a cadence versus, well, let's go to lunch and see what they say. And, right? and I think, and I think most importantly through that process, Julia, you have trust. So yeah. through, through that process, uh, through, you know, being genuine, through transparency, mm -hmm. you have earned trust. Uh, so it's no surprise to the potential donor or investor to your organization when it comes time for the ask that you're making the ask. It's not a big surprise by the time you get to that place in your, you know, in your relationship, in your cost selling relationship. Yeah, I love that you said that because you're right. We haven't um, we haven't used that word enough. And, and trust is such an incredible thing because especially when you're asking somebody who's worked really hard to earn their money to hand it over for a philanthropic investment, that you do have that trust, mm -hmm. you know, and that you've gained that. It's you're not going to walk away from that relationship once you get the check. Hopefully not. <laughs> you know, you're going to you're going to keep moving through it and you're going to steward it and you're going to be looking at this. Um, in a in a much different way. So I appreciate that that you brought that up and, and kind of reframed it. My next question to you, Tony, is how can non fundraisers be involved in cost selling? And I ask this with the lens that a lot of times board members are like, "What the hell? Why aren't you raising money? Why aren't you asking more people? You know, what's wrong with you? Why haven't you made these goals? Why haven't you talked to this rich person? Um, and there's no connectivity to what development does. I'm going to go back to this horrible, horrible stat that we actually even asked the, uh, the president of AFP, Association of Fundraising Professionals, Mike Geiger, to um, verify in person on the nonprofit show the average development director only stays with a nonprofit 19 months. That's true. Horrible. I mean, if we if we were plumbers and we were the Plumbers Association of America and we said the average plumber, after all that training, after all that work, after all that apprenticeship, only stays on the job 19 months. It would be a national crisis, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. These are trained, educated professionals, and they're staying in the job 19 months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do we bridge this gap between getting people that are supporting us, leading us, and navigating, you know, this incredible, incredible talent? Well, I think part of it is that we need to continue our support of organizations like AFP. Uh, who who continue to elevate fundraising as a profession? Uh, okay. So I, I think that that's you know that that's important. Uh, but but thinking of, of your slide here, non fundraisers you know be involved in cost selling. Selling is a team sport, and again we hear that all the time. I'm not the first to say it, but it takes a lot of folks uh, to be engaged in fundraising in order for your fundraising plans and strategies to be successful. And there are so many different roles that folks can play in fundraising, whether mm -hmm. there's the solicitor, whether they're making referrals, whether they're doing the prospecting or the research. I mean, there are just many, many ways that folks can engage in fundraising without having to be the person that makes the ask. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's really all about talking to everyone you know, on your staff, all of your volunteers, just making sure that there is a point of entry for everyone to support fundraising wherever their comfort level might rest in terms of the process. So again, whether that's prospecting, whether that's referrals, whether that's actually making the ask, plenty of places for everyone to be engaged, you know, in a meaningful way yeah. and, and help the organizations raise the money that they need for the communities that they're, they're serving. So yes, non fundraisers should definitely be involved in cost selling, uh, continue to be creative and think about ways to engage everyone that has a passion 
for your organization and your organization's mm -hmm. mission. There are so many more ways now, especially with AI, uh, mm -hmm. to engage and get information from, from folks. So yes, mm -hmm. non-fundraisers should definitely be involved. So then let me go the other direction. And that is this, um, because sometimes the, the, the development team or the fundraisers are a little, I don't want to use the word cagey, but they're like, I don't want to jinx it, but I'm going to go visit this person. And they don't always like lay out who their connecting points are because they don't want, I don't know, they, they don't want a lot of things to happen. Right. So what does that look like to you? So that the people, let's say in the cafeteria, um, know who you're going to be talking to or who know what you're going towards or your goals. I mean, how much do we share, if you will, about what's going on so that the team knows, not just the C-suite, but I'm talking like the receptionist, you know, the day porters, everybody on our campus. What does that look like to you? Yeah, so I, I think I think that internal communication plays a really important role in this, Julia, and there are many different ways that organizations kind of tackle that. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether that's in monthly all team convenings, whether that's in person or on Zoom, where every department has an opportunity to give an update and kind of highlights on, on their successes or highlighting some of the obstacles or challenges that they're having, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a monthly newsletter that goes out to the, you know, the all staff and, and development has a place in that newsletter to provide mm -hmm. updates. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think internal communication and having a strong internal communication uh, process uh, is really important to make sure that everyone kind of understands, uh, you know, the work that's being done. That would be okay. my best. Let me ask you this question then, and, and that kind of dovetails to, you know, keeping the wolves at the door. And that is, whoops, I just accidentally hit a, a, a different, a wrong button. Um, do you think that it's a good thing or maybe a not such a good thing for the development team to communicate where they are in, in achieving their annual goal? And the reason why I say this is because I was talking to an organization that recently just flipped. They never shared with their team, with the, the, the staff, and it's sizable, where they were with the sales goal, because they felt like it put the staff in fear. Like, holy cow, if development doesn't raise this money, my job is not secure, and I might get fired. Mm. Um do you have a sense of that, of what we should be sharing or not? Well, I think that that's a very legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, again, I, I think that one of the primary foundations of successful nonprofit leadership is transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know how you lead authentically and with full transparency if you're not sharing with folks where you are in terms of, of your fundraising. Uh, yeah. So I, yeah. I am, again, every organization is different. Every culture is different. I would want to cultivate a culture of trust to such a degree that that information can be shared. Mm -hmm. And if someone does have a concern about their job or, or the organization's sustainability, that they can openly ask those questions and have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, I love that. Um, I love that approach because I think that's a much more um, authentic approach. And I also think that maybe it helps everybody row in the same direction because I don't know about you, but I feel like from the board, even within the C-suite, of course, through the rank and file of our nonprofits, most folks, when they think about the, the fundraisers, on the front lines they're like oh they're the people that go out to lunch and they go to you know swanky parties and they get to drink i mean you know it's kind of a they're there and we're here i mm -hmm. mean do you see that i i think i saw that more pre-pandemic than i probably do now only because the i think the work has shifted uh, a little bit 
Uh, but yes, there there can easily be that per, you know perception from folks that are managing the programs and you know that are the first point of contact with the clients that that we're serving. Uh, I could certainly see how that that perception you know might exist. Uh, so even even more important that internal communication be outstanding and that everyone be involved. So in, invite your program coordinators, your program managers to some of these events mm -hmm. uh, so that they can really get a sense of what it's like uh, for you to attend them. And what it kind of looks like is you're trying to develop and nurture these relationships mm -hmm. uh, as you're as you're attending these uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, it's somewhat of a a cross training issue. And I think programming gets, you know, man, the fundraisers have to go out, they have to fund for programming that they don't always understand, or they haven't truly witnessed, or maybe it's still being it's in development, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, we, we have for such a catastrophic lack of um, knowledge between what these different silos are doing. And it seems to me, it's another one of those foundational issues that we could be doing a better job with. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, really interesting. Well, Tony Bell, always, 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 I love talking with you. I think you're truly one of the great minds and thought leaders of our, of our national um, landscape when it comes to the nonprofit sector. And so I always appreciate your thoughtful, guidance and feedback um you do say things that oftentimes to me that are that i'm like oh wow i hadn't thought of that or you know you you help me to pivot and to be i think uh more in line with what current thinking is and so i really appreciate that um and and it's always just a joy to, to be talking with you we're going to do this every friday we're going to have this this episode be dedicated to fundraisers friday and so You'll be hearing more about it. Um, if you're a thought leader within the sector and dealing with fundraising, whether you have a product or software or a technique, or maybe you are somebody that's engaged in this leadership of fundraising and, and your team, or your organization, we want to connect with you because this we really believe is the root of so much consternation in our sector. And we want to make it easier, more logical, more natural, and ultimately more successful. Right, Tony? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all about helping folks build skills and feel more empowered in the work that they do. Right. I love that. I love that you said that. See what I said? You're, you, always, you always know what to say. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Well, this has been a joyous way for us to kick off Fundraisers Friday. Lots of fun. Um, if you have topics that you think we should talk about, we want to hear from you. Our presenting sponsors include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, of course, the new Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that support us day in and day out on the Nonprofit Show. Okay. Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. Once again, you blown my mind. Thank you. Hair on fire. Um, you set me up for some great thoughts and, and great thinking. Um, and I'm really, really appreciative that you are on our team as one of our valued co-hosts. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the opportunity, Julia. It's such an honor. It's really a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, we end each and every episode with this mantra. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here again for another.